We now return to local news with Sonia. Sonia. A one day festival canalology. Pardon? Canalology is aiming to give you a very different view of Tottenham's sometimes forgotten waterways. A pedal powered canty floss maker, cloud deck chairs, portable foxes, and an elaborate home for birds are just some of the surprising objects that have been created to celebrate the area's canals. The free day of art will see public spaces from Markfield Park to Stonebridge Lock filled with sculpture, drawing, digital animation, performance art, installation and architecture alongside a programme of storytelling, talks and workshops. The unique celebration is the work of 16 artists who were challenged to create films, drawings and installations to map the network of waterways, exploring them as passageways or as barriers in the landscape of the city and delving into their hidden histories. The range of art will include a hand-drawn map of the canals in Tottenham by artist Mary Yacoub. Nomadic Architecture Workshop, Atelier Francais, will pursue an interest in the Lee Canal side as a home for wildlife and create shelters, two wooden structures appearing for one day only and aiming to act as a home for birds. These tall open frame architectural installations will be built partly with reclaimed and found wood from the area. Artist Fiona Long will present Sublime Canogie Floss, in which visitors will be served delicious yet sludgy green coloured candy floss resembling canal algae. The project has been led by Post Artists, a network for artists making site specific work, with grants for the arts funding from Arts Council England. Samantha Penn post chairperson who is also one of the artists exhibiting says we aim to find out and present fascinating things about Tottenham to show this part of the capital in new and different ways in the understanding that while art can temporarily alter the landscape in surprising and magical ways the character of the canals in Tottenham is a true one-off artists taking part are Atelier Francais, who are Francesco Gorni and Serena Montesisa, Gwen Bajon, James Kappa, Mary Yacoub, Olga Koroleva, Fiona Long, Rebecca Leach, Ilke Leukefeld, Samantha Penn, Jenny Rolf Herbert, Natasha Vickers, Helena Wee and Pippa Kocherek, working in collaboration with Marco Kali and Aliki Kailika as the unasked for public art agency. The free exhibition takes place on Saturday the 3rd of May, 12 noon to 5 p.m. in a route along the canal from Markfield Place, sorry, Markfield Park, North 15, to Stonebridge Lock, North 17, next to Tottenham Marshes. The participating artists have been blogging about the works at www.postartists.com forward slash canalology. Enfield Town still have work to do to secure their future in the Ryman Premier Division heading into the final day of the season after slumping to a 5-3 defeat at home to East Thurrock United on Monday. A one-all draw at Wingate and Finchley on Saturday meant that Town knew that a point in this match would be enough to banish the threat of relegation, and they made the perfect start, taking the lead through Ryan Doyle inside the first minute. However, they then endured a nightmare 20-minute spell, during which time they conceded four times, and they never really recovered from this to leave them needing to beat basement side Cray Wanderers on Saturday at 3pm to make sure they retain their place at this level, regardless of other results. We got off to a great start, but then we collapsed for 20 minutes, and that gave us a mountain to climb, said manager George Borg. 
However, anyone would have bitten your hand off if you'd offered us being in this position going into the final day of the season when I took over. People need to remember that when I took charge in December, we only had 12 points and were down and out, heading for definite relegation. The lads have been tremendous and have worked really hard to give us a good chance of staying up. I want everyone to realise what an outstanding job the players have done and I hope the public of Enfield get behind us for our final game. Tang got off to a dream start as Doyle volleyed in a Bradley Quinton corner inside 60 seconds, but an unmarked Mitch Gilby got East Thurrock back on level terms six minutes later. Steve Sheehan headed the visitors into the lead on 13 minutes and they added a third in the 19th minute when young keeper James Chalk handed a rare start after first choice Noel Inver suffered a dislocated shoulder at Wingate could only drop a Sam Higgins cross into his own net. Neil Richmond then scored with a simple tap-in on 25 minutes but Town did improve in the second period and Mitch Hahn reduced their deficit with a fine header in the 58th minute. Any chance of a comeback was ended on 73 minutes when Lewis Smith put in the rebound after Cholk had saved a Higgins penalty and Liam Hope's terrific shot from the edge of the box in the 90th minute made no difference to the final outcome. Saturday's match saw Hahn give Town the lead on 53 minutes but Josh Kennett equalised almost immediately and the visitors had emergency keeper Lee White to thank for securing a point as he made a stunning last gap save from Ahmet Rifat at point blank range. This is an article from Sue Younger of the Friends of Brumfield Park. While I support the erection of a war memorial dedicated to the servicemen and women who have lost their lives since World War II, and this was the advertiser April the 9th, I would urge Councillor Chris Bond not to neglect the existing war memorials in the borough. In Broomfield Park, we have a Garden of Remembrance and War Memorial dedicated to all the servicemen and women from the old borough of Southgate who lost their lives in the two world wars. This was opened in July 1929. However, it has been sadly neglected in recent years, resulting in the pond losing its fountain and the sundial its brass plate. Only one of the original six benches, built from wood from HMS Dido, which sank in 1916 during World War I, is still standing. The actual World War I memorial is suffering from damp caused by overgrown ivy, so that the wooden roof is in danger of collapsing and the walls are covered in black mould. In fact, even the memorial plaques, which were replaced by the council after they were stolen in 2009, suffer from damp whenever it rains. The Friends of Broomfield Park are applying to the War Memorial Trust for a grant to restore the Garden of Remembrance and War Memorial. However, the Trust will not cover any work which is classed as essential repairs and is the responsibility of Enfield Council. Even if we are successful in our bid, we will only receive a maximum of 75% of the grant, so the Friends still have to find ways to raise a substantial amount of money. As 2014 is the centenary of the outbreak of World War I, the Friends would like the garden and war memorial to be restored in time for the centenary on August the 4th. But, if that's not possible, at least in time for the annual Armistice Day service held in the garden on November the 11th. And this is followed by a shorter article from John Mitchell of the London and South East Branch Suez Veterans Association. And he says, The announcement that a new war memorial to servicemen and women who gave their lives for their country after World War II is to be applauded. The project has been long in the making. However, veterans with whom I have spoken are unhappy with Enfield Council's choice of site, St Michael's Green in Chase Side, as they think that it will be hidden away from the town centre. One thinks immediately of Enfield's more prominent war memorial in Windmill Hill, Chase Side, and the one that has been erected facing the Civic Centre in Silver Street, Enfield, to commemorate Arctic Convoy veterans. Surely, the veterans ask, it would be more appropriate to consider this latter site 
where it would be seen by the general public, some of whom are related to the post-World War II fallen. Two MPs have stepped up their campaign to improve train services for the people of Enfield. Enfield North MP Nick Dubois and Enfield Southgate MP David Burrows are calling for refunds for delays and cancellation to be automatic. Both MPs have campaigned for compu commuters since a series of incidents in which the First Capital Connect, that's FCC, service that passes through Enfield to London was delayed or cancelled. Mr Dubois and Mr Burrows both spoke in Parliament earlier this year, expressing their concern with the services and have now called on FCC, Network Rail and Greater Anglia to up their game. Mr Dubois said, We need to make sure that Greater Anglia, First Capital Connect and Network Rail make good on their promises of greater investment, which will ensure the infrastructure is improved and therefore reduce delays substantially. What's more, it's vital we ensure passengers can hold these organisations to account rather than be passed off with flimsy excuses on promises of jam tomorrow. The pair have insisted on improvements, including automating the refund process for delays or cancellations for Oyster Card and season ticket holders, so there will be no need for passengers to apply. They would also like a simpler refund system for those without season tickets or Oyster Cards, and for operators such as Greater Anglia and FCC to meet minimum independent pass passenger satisfaction survey levels as a condition of contract. And with the current rolling stock almost 40 years old, the MPs have also called for investment in new trains. Mr Burrows said, we have secured good intentions and, ins and assurances from Network Rail and FCC. Now it's time for them to put their money where their mouth is and pay commuters when things go wrong. We will continue to press for an improved service for our constituents who deserve better. First Capital Connect runs the Hartford Loop Overground Service, which runs through Cruise Hill, Gordon Hill, Enfield Chase, Grange Park, Winchmore Hill and Palmer's Green. And the Greater Anglia Service passes through Enfield Town, Enfield Lock, Brimsdown, Southbury, Turkey Street and Bushill Park stations. Sonia. A new film about racial tensions on a university campus will open in cinemas across the country this week. Arjun and Alison is a revenge thriller set at Birmingham University, with the city serving as an ethnically diverse backdrop. The film will have a limited release via Cineworld Cinemas from Friday. Playing the lead role is Shiv Jala, 27, who was born and raised in Edmonton, and studied at a film school in Mumbai, the entertainment capital of India. The actor told the advertiser that the film is about creating debate over issues, not only concerning racial tension, but also other forms of discrimination. There are always different diverse communities coming into the country, so it is definitely a relevant topic, said Sheev. First and foremost, films are about entertainment. Hopefully, this is something people will enjoy watching. They'll get their money's worth. But it's also so they can ask themselves questions. Have I been discriminated against? Have I discriminated against someone else? Sheev talks about the struggle he has faced within the film industry against typecasting, saying that there are still a lot of stereotypes which make it difficult for Indian actors to play more than one kind of role. I spent six years trying to find the right part before I auditioned for Arjun and Alice, he said. We have an amazing cast. I really had to raise the bar and push myself. Working with everyone on the set has been a brilliant experience. 
Rather than sitting back and waiting for change to happen, Sheev has begun co-writing his own film, which he hopes will create a new spin on a successful genre. It's a buddy movie about two boys from an Indian village, he explained. You have to think as commercially as possible when you're writing, and it's very difficult to write comedy. But I wanted to put a different edge on what is currently a successful genre in film. Arjun and Alison was selected for last year's Saint-Tropez International Film Festival and was nominated for Best Film. Monique Squarey, who plays Alison, picked up the Best Actress Award at the same festival. A monthly aquathlon series is being launched at the Lee Valley White Water Centre, offering budding athletes the opportunity to take part in an exciting new sporting event. The London 2012 Olympic venue in Waltham Cross is the setting for the aquathlon, which begins with an open water swim in the centre's lake over two distances, either 250 or 500 metres, followed by a 3 or 5.5 kilometre run around the River Lee Country Park. Simon Ricketts, centre manager, said, The flat lake at Lee Valley White Water Centre provides an excellent open swim facility as the water is clean and filtered with good access in and out. This is a huge advantage over most open water lakes and will be especially attractive for beginners. The run through the River Lee Country Park is also flat, scenic and free of traffic. The Aquathlon series will run on the second Tuesday of every month from May until September and the first race on May the 6th starts at 7.30pm, with registration available an hour earlier. Each event will take place under British triathlon rules, and the last event will be held on September the 2nd. Participants over the separate distances will be identified by different coloured swim hats and race numbers. They must be aged 18 or older on the day of the race. The entry fee is £15 or £12 for members of the British Triathlon Federation. Campaigners protesting against a 231 home housing development in Cat Hill have teamed up with a band of environmental activists who have set up camp on the edge of the site. The Save Cat Hill campaign, which is made up of residents and politicians opposed to the project by housing developer London and Quadrant, has formed an alliance with several members of the Occupy movement to create a permanent presence at the site in Cockfosters. The activists, who are part of the same group that successfully reopened the Axed Free and Barnet Library in 2012, say they plan to monitor the impact of building work on the natural landscape. Eco-warrior Kimmy Starchild told the advertiser, our aim is to encourage and empower people to stand up for their rights and their community. We have set up camp to protect the site from further destruction. Twelve ancient trees on the site have protection orders on them, but as far as we are aware, the developers have ignored these and felled the trees. Kim Coleman, leader of the Save Cat Hill campaign, which has continued to fight the development since it was approved by Enfield Council in March last year, said she looked forward to working hand-in-hand -hand with the activists. We welcome them enormously because we need extra support and these people do know what they're doing, she said. She added that the activists' constant presence had al has allowed her to spend more time away from the protest pursuing other avenues of opposition, such as legal challenges. However, Ellen Q insists that it has complied with every environmental requirement set before it and that its specialist tree experts and ecologists continue to liaise with Enfield Council and Natural England. A spokeswoman added, Our aim is to create a site that will offer improved and more diverse habitats to support wildlife and biodiversity. On Saturday, campaigners celebrated the merger with a protest party. An abundance festival celebrating the site's wildlife is taking place this Saturday and Sunday. A hairdresser's has recently been given a five-star rating by a salon guide. James Whitaker Hair 
in Lancaster Road, Enfield, was awarded the top honour, and owner James Whiffin said he is delighted by the news. He said, "The Good Salon Guide is the long-awaited me- yes, that's right is the long-awaited measure that enables clients to know their hairdresser is a true professional." We are delighted to have in, achieved independent recognition of this salon's standards. Dawson Penn, chairman of the Good Salon Guide, said, I am delighted that James Whitaker Hare has succeeded in reaching the standards required to become a member of the Good Salon Guide. The Good Salon Guide highlights the professional status of hairdressers and will ensure that clients have confidence in their choice of hairdresser. A driving examiner wowed the MasterChef judges and made it through to the quarterfinals last week. Joe Davis, who grew up in Enfield, has been serving up tasty plates of mouth-watering food to his family for years. And after unsuccessfully cajoling by friends and relatives, His mother finally took matters into her own hands. All my family and friends kept telling me I had to do it, the 34-year-old admitted. I was never brave enough, but in the end my mum surprised me by applying for me, and before I knew it I was on the show. The amateur chef, who was born in Chase Farm Hospital, grew up in Broadlands Avenue, Enfield Highway, and graduated from the University of Hertfordshire with an economics degree, impressed on his way to the quarterfinals, where he served up a meal of pan-fried fillet of pork with pig's cheeks and bacon truffles, along with spring vegetables and a swede and carrot puree. Although the long-running TV cookery talent show, now in its tenth series, is renowned for making the contestants sweat under the glare of judges, critics and professional chefs, Joe told the advertiser that on set, the atmosphere is a little more relaxed. John Tarot and Greg Wallace aren't scary. They're normal professional guys with a passion for food, just like the contestants. They really want you to do well, but they don't take prisoners when you don't, he said. However, his master chef foray ended in Friday's quarterfinal, where Joe said he was proud of his performance, but ultimately it was not to be. Joe's favourite go-to meal to serve up of an evening is a giant seafood paella. And if he had to choose any one dish in the world to cook and devour, a beautifully marbled double rib of beef on a hot sunny day on the barbecue, he said, so it's lovely and charred on the outside and blushing pink in the middle. It can't be beaten in summer weather and goes perfectly with a nice cold beer. Flats at a new development of 29 homes have sold out months ahead of schedule. Hundreds of people registered an interest in the development by Fairview New Homes, called Vogue, and sales quickly followed. The flats are being built on the site of a former NHS building in Eaton Road, Enfield Town. Fairview sales director Stephen Allenby said, Vogue is an unusual development with an enviable combination of appealing features. Enfield Town Railway Station is less than five minutes walk away, and from there you can be in central London in just over half an hour. The private block of flats will have enhanced security features and underground parking. People buying the one, two and three bedroom flats were from all ages and backgrounds, with most already living locally. Fairview New Homes' next development in Enfield Town will be in Cecil Road, with more details on the scheme being released later this year. Street clutter, such as irresponsibly placed shop advertising signs and pavement cafe furniture, can obstruct and hamper a person's progress on the street. Keeping pathways clear is particularly crucial for the independence of people who are blind and partially sighted. A recent guide dog survey for Streets Ahead campaign showed A-boards and cafe furniture are both in the top ten most common street clutter items, acting as a real barrier to a person's independence. 
Shockingly, 65% of people with sight loss have been injured by street clutter. It also prevents wheelchair users and other vulnerable pedestrians from using the pavements with confidence. Several local councils have already introduced measures to reduce unnecessary clutter. For example, shops can use window adverts instead of multiple A boards to entice customers and improve the street for pedestrians. I would like you all to join me in a campaign to ask the council to introduce measures to tackle unnecessary street clutter and ensure that our high street is fully accessible to those who are blind or partially sighted. Please email campaigns at guided dogs. Sorry, I'll say that again. Uh, please email campaigns at guide dogs.org UK for more information about their campaign and survey findings. We have reached the end of our programme for this week. Thank you for listening. So, from the team of Sonia, Jenny, Phil and myself and Robin on the controls, it's goodbye. Bye. Please remember to turn over the address label in your postal packet. Put the cassette into the packet and return it to us as soon as possible in readiness for the next edition. Don't forget... You can call Diane de Jersey regarding any help you may require in connection with Enfield Talking Newspaper. The Enfield Talking Newspaper will be with you again in one week's time.